Um, so the, we're going to review. So the Holy Spirit is God Amen. and the Lord our God is one. Amen. Amen. Yes. And everything starts there. If we don't get that, we won't get anything. If we don't get that, if we don't get the Lord our God is one, then we don't get the unity of the body. We won't get that. We won't understand it. We are all one in him. The kingdom of God functions in love and unity, and so what must we? I guess, you know, I review and I pick out the most important aspects of it because this is the stuff we have to get down. We are one, and we must love each other and work toward unity at all times. There can not be any division in war. When you're fighting next to somebody, you guys can't be divided. You have to be on the same mission, with the same passion, the same intent. And that's where we go. So we work toward unity. Through Yeshua, we have been given legitimacy and authority, right? We found that out. Legitimacy, we're legitimate sons, and we have the authority as sons. And through the Holy Spirit, we've been given power to accomplish God's purposes in the earth. And that's what we're talking about with the Holy Spirit and with the gifts of the Spirit. It is for his purposes in the earth to show the earth who he is. Amen. He wants to show the earth his goodness, his mercy, his plans. He is revealing. He is revealing all the time. Sometimes we are too dull of hearing or sight. To, to understand what he's saying to us, but he's revealing all the time. Through that power, the power of the Spirit, his power, we will make his enemies his footstool. Amen? Mm -hmm. Says Jesus will. Jesus has, and we continue that mission until the very end. The directive's already been given. We must deal with the beastly nature of the old man and conform to the image of Christ. That is our inner struggle, our inner battle. Okay, that's we've got to have that battle inside of ourselves to reckon ourselves dead, dead to sin, dead to the past, so that we can move on in newness of life, in the power of the Spirit, accomplishing the plans of our Father. Because we're not earthlings, we're citizens of heaven. If we do that, we stay passionate for the Lord, we will have our Shavuot moment. Shavuot is when the word was given. The law was given on Shavuot. The spirit was poured out on Shavuot. If we will take care of our beastly nature during the 49 days of, of, of Omer, counting, counting the days between, Penteco between, Pe between Passover and Pentecost, Shavuot, 40, 50 days total, you weren't here for that, so I'll recap. 49 days, they gave a barley harvest. But on the 50th day, they cooked two loaves of wheat bread. Okay. So barley is food. significant of the food of Egypt. Barley is livestock food, not people food. We deal with our beastly natures for 49 years. And then on the 50th, on the fullness of time, 50 means fullness of time, on that fullness of time, then... The Spirit comes in His fullness to our lives. That's the pattern. And that's what we're doing. We're all, we're all, we've all been filled with the Holy Spirit, right? With the evidence of speaking in tongues, which is only the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit. But there are other baptisms. And the baptism of fire is what's coming next. Right, Greg? Right. The baptism of fire is coming next. And we've got to get to that point. With that fire comes passion and direction for ministry. They, the disciples were filled with the Spirit, right? They, they were casting out demons. They were healing the sick, right? But when he left, when he ascended, they went back to fishing because they had no direction for ministry. But when Pentecost came, Shavuot, the fire fell in the room. And then they went out immediately to the streets and began their work as apostles, evangelists, prophets, fishermen with no education, okay? Tax collectors became apostles, engineers, 
mechanics, fire chiefs. You should have a head start on us. <laughs> Homemakers, teachers, business people, students. When the fire comes, you're changed. And that's the fullness of time. We've got to focus on getting to that point where we have the passion and the power to do the work of the ministry. We cannot be satisfied with what we had yesterday. Does that catch you up, Keith? Yeah. Okay. We must focus on our kingdom citizenship and put down our own wishes and carnal desires. Be about our Father's business. I'm telling you, if God is saying anything, He's saying, get to, down to my business. Now is the time for me. Now, enough of making your own house. It's time to build up the house of God. Amen. Amen. To get this job done, we must have more than a drink of living water. We need to be totally submerged and saturated with God's Spirit. I compared being filled with the Spirit as just take, being, being saved is like taking a drink of water. Being filled with the Spirit is like stepping into a pool. But being the fire coming down, being pacified, uh, baptized in fire is like being totally submerged to where you get out and you're dripping everywhere and it gets on everyone. That's what is necessary now. We've got to be so full of him that our shadow heals the sick. Our clothing is so saturated with the power of God that when people touch us, they know we're God people. Right? Yes. The different symbols of the Spirit point to some of his functions and the different baptisms. The, he's called the seal, which stands for our salvation. And that's the baptism into his name, right? The water, the initial feeling, and the baptism in, of, in water. Fire, he's called fire. Uh, the passion for service, the baptism of fire, and the ho unholiness. He's, he, one of his symbols is oil, anointing for service. He's the dove. Talks about hosting the presence of God. The dove resting on Jesus' shoulder, taking him with him everywhere he went. Wind, that there's no boundaries or restrictions. The Holy Spirit, you can't contain him. You can't restrict him. He will do what he will do. It's a refreshing. The wind can be refreshing or it can be a proclamation of judgment. It can be a hurricane or it can be a gentle breeze. And then he's called the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, the glory of the Father. But it also comes with that. When you have glory, the next thing that happens is persecution. And then the next thing that happens is glory. And then the next thing that happens is persecution. And then the next thing that happens is glory. Glory upon glory, faith upon faith. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a mystical thing. We've got to get away from all that. This is a natural progression of every believer. I, I'm, I'm done arguing about the Holy Spirit and whether people should speak in tongues. I'm done. Well, yes, you should speak in tongues. Everyone should speak in tongues. I'm just going to get that out there now. There's great benefits to it. I'm not going into that yet, but we'll, we, we will in the future. It's, a soup, it's, a na it's naturally supernatural progression of any believer. According to John 14, it is the will of the Father that we do the works of Jesus and greater. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read that, you should read that whole chapter. And I think that puts an end to whether we should be walking like Jesus. It's obvious. We should be walking like Jesus. And it's not God's fault if we're not. We got to look at ourselves. It also says that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. If we do that, then they, the Godhead, will come and make their home in us. So if we're not full of God, maybe we're not loving him by keeping his commandments. Because it says if we do, if we love him and keep his commandments, they will come and live inside of us. So we better look at ourselves, go back to the 49 days, get rid of the barley, offer up those things to God. God, take that. God, I lay that down. I'm laying that down at the altar. I'm laying that down at the altar. I'm, I see this, Lord, and I'm laying that down at the altar. Burn it up, burn it up. 
After being filled with the Spirit, we are eligible to be a recipient of his gifts. A prayer language, praying in tongues, and one more, one or more of the nine gifts of the Spirit that are listed. You know, for teaching purposes, there's categories. But God can do whatever he wants to do. Mm, that's right. For us to understand what he's doing, we have categories. But you're going to see, as, as we did last time, that they all overlap. Mm -hmm. Okay? So once you're filled with the Spirit, you're eligible for your prayer language and at least one of the gifts. But you, you can have all of the gifts. It's according to his will and his purpose. So if you need tongues and interpretation, then that's what you need. If, you, if somebody's sick, then I guess you need gifts of healing. Tongues and interpretation aren't going to do much for that. Right? right? We've got to know that we can have these, that we can walk in them in, in fullness so that when we meet somebody or, or someone comes and has a need, that we have the answer. The gifts are given as he, the Spirit, wills and for the purposes of the mission or calling to accomplish the will of the Father. You know, it's so funny because Paul says, desire, covet earnestly the, the best gifts. It doesn't say, be jealous of your brother that has more than you. It doesn't say that. It says, for you to desire earnestly. You go after them. You go after them. Don't worry about what God gave him. That's according to his will. God, what do you have for me? What, what is it that you want from me, Lord? I want to receive it. Stop worrying about your neighbor. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant to glorify God. They're meant to glorify God, not make us famous. They're meant to glorify God and confirm his almighty power and preeminence. They're signs that follow those who believe. Okay, that's just simple. If we believe, we're going to have the signs. It says, the word says it. It says it. They are signs that follow those who believe. It's normal. It's natural. It's supernaturally natural. Wow, that's funny how you say that because we almost look at people that have the signs as somebody special. It's not. It's special because God is special. But it's not, it doesn't make us special. It's just normal for us. It was normal for Jesus. Oh, you're comparing yourself to Jesus? Well, he compares himself, he compares us to him. We're his body. Made in his image. Made in his image. So if they don't follow us, what do we believe? If they don't follow us, it kind of shows what we believe. Right? You'll know them by their fruits. Right. The gifts are not meant for entertainment or to tickle the senses. We're not going to turn them into a show. This is not a show. This is to deliver people, set them free, get them realigned with God on a course of victory and blessing. We don't monopolize the gift. We yield to the gift because it's the Holy Spirit. He is the gift. He's the promise. We don't seek the gift. We seek Jesus. But Paul said we can desire earnestly the best gifts. Okay, but we don't put all of our heart in the gift. We put our heart in Jesus. He's the giver of the gift. He's the baptizer of the, in the Holy Spirit. He may use anyone he chooses. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant to glorify God and confirm his almighty power preeminence. I read that. The gifts are not meant for entertainment. Oh, here, am I, where am I? Okay, we do not monopolize. Okay, the gifts enable us for every mission he has given to us. If he calls you, he will equip you. That's right. Whatever he calls you to do, he will give you the tools to do it. Amen. And the gifts are part of those tools. If he calls you to Africa, you need a few miracles there. <laughs> they're, used to seeing, they're used to seeing witchcraft. Yeah. They've got to see the real. We need here. And we need them here, too. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we need them here more than we do there. We must be obedient and responsible with the gifts or we will end up in rebellion and witchcraft. And we have seen that. We have seen that over and over with people that started off really good, end up really bad. We must give all the glory to God or we will end up disqualified. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about the last one? 
We must be obedient and responsible with the gifts or we will end up in rebellion and witchcraft. Can you talk a little bit more about how people end up in witchcraft? Well, they start thinking that they're all that. And then when the spirit departs because of their pride, they continue on in witchcraft. They will conjure. They will try to make things happen in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And then the devil will be right there to encourage them in that. Yeah. It's, not by the will of God. it's not by the will of God anymore. It's by their own charisma, mm -hmm. their personal fleshly charisma. And then pretty soon the spirit of witchcraft will be right there to suck them in. Yeah, the gift doesn't leave necessarily, but it can be corrupted but because we have a bad filter. Does that answer it? You want to speak yeah, to it anymore? Yeah, you know, because sometimes yeah. we say stuff like that. And the fact, if we're, if we're not utilizing the gift the way that we're supposed to utilize it, and we get into rebellion, the scripture says that witchcraft is as rebellion. Rebellion is as witchcraft. So if you get, if you get outside of God's will and you get into rebellion, witchcraft will be right there. That spirit will be right there to work with you. So stay obedient, yeah. right? Stay humble. Stay obedient. That's the key. Yeah. Stay humble. humble. Stay That's right. Humble. Realize where stay. the gift comes from. Stay it's not humble. us. That's right. We're just a vessel. He, the Holy Spirit, does the work. I always think of manipulation with witchcraft. Yes. When that comes right with witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's right. That's Manipulation and witchcraft go together. We must give all the glory to God or we will, we will end up disqualified. Have compassion on those who need to see a sign to believe on the goodness of God. You know, somehow we become judge. And we're like, well, they don't deserve it. Look at their life. They don't deserve it. Who are we? to make that determination. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Jesus went to the lowly, the lepers, the poor. So we gotta get off our high horse. We're not the judge, we're the vessel. We're the vessel, just be obedient and humble. Confront the religious. What do we do to do with the religious? We confront them. Teach, lead, and show the ignorant and the fearful. Let's back up on, to back up on the rebellion and witchcraft. Okay. It goes back to Matthew 7, 21, 23. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Ooh, yeah. But that's just it. All he does that do the will of him and you don't get that by just la di da. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to know it. Right. And he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Right. Cast out demons in your name? Yep. And done many wonders in your name? In your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. Rebellion. Even though they did lawlessness in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And apparently, and there was, especially if you're going to do wonders, mm -hmm. prophesying, wonders, these miracles, miracles, all in the name of Jesus, but they were rebels. Because they, they weren't obedient. They weren't obedient to his will. What do you think? That, that's back to that difficulty we have with gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit and innate gifts in people that they seem to be born with, and even as children may be working in, but it's not necessarily God. Right. Well, that's why Jesus said, don't look at the gift. He said, look at the fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. He didn't say you'll know them by, your, by their gifts. You won't know them by their, their physical or their, yeah, their physical endowments, their charisma. You won't know them. We're not to know people like that. We're to know people by the Spirit. And we're to look at the fruits in their life. That's the only thing we have to, guide, to gear, to uh, determine whether it's someone we want to follow or not. Because it could be manipulation. Manipulation, charisma, what seduction, deception. Manipulation. 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 Um, that was excellent because when, we, when Stephanie and I were in uh, the church in um, 
uh, Sanford, we had a um, minister, woman minister, and from all appearances, mm -hmm. she seemed like very quote spiritual and whatnot, mm -hmm. and just 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 something was wrong. Every time we turned around, she was chewing somebody out. Uh -huh. It wasn't right. Yeah. And I started, and I prayed about it one day. I was like, God, what is going on? And God told me it was witchcraft. It actually blew me away. Yeah. I was not expecting witchcraft. Right. But you know, that is the, that is the, I say the tend the normal tendency of anybody that's prophetic because we are very sensitive to the spirit realm. Yeah. That is the one thing that we can, if we don't watch ourselves, we can get into. Get into. Yeah. When we go outside of his will, outside of what he tells us to do, and we just rip through the spirit and decide we're going to do it on our own. Mm -hmm. You start getting words like, from those kind of prophets, like, God's telling me, you need to come and clean my house until you learn obedience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we got to stay out of that. <laughs> okay, we're to confront the religious, but we're to teach, lead, and show the ignorant and the fearful. God separates the two. The, two. the fearful and the ignorant are not like the religious. We confront the religious because they should know better. They have the word. But the ignorant and the fearful, they don't. So we have more compassion upon them. And God does too. Paul admonishes us to not be ignorant of the gifts and to desire the best gifts. So, it's, so it's, it's possible, if Paul said it, it's possible that we could be ignorant of the gifts, right? He said, don't, don't be, but it's possible. Okay, so now are you ready? Go on. Okay, so the revelation gifts reveal something. God is omniscient, but he doesn't give all of his wisdom to any one person. And he doesn't reveal everything to us all at once. He reveals a fragment of his wisdom, his knowledge of the future to a man or woman, that which he wants that person to know at that time. That's what a word of wisdom is. It's a fragment of his understanding and omniscience of the future. Remember we talked about last time that word of knowledge is for now or the past, word of wisdom is for the future. Word of wisdom, he supernaturally reveals a fragment of his wisdom to us. Word of knowledge, he supernaturally reveals a fragment of his knowledge to us. And discerning of spirits, he supernaturally reveals the spirit realm to us, whether it's by knowing or by seeing, by sensing, by hearing, Gifts of the Spirit often overlap, especially within their category. You see, you see um, wisdom and, word of wisdom and word of knowledge and discerning of spirits overlap frequently because God's showing them something for the future and it's still in the spirit realm. It hasn't manifested in the natural yet. So you're going to have all this overlapping. You'll see it in the scripture as we go on. We looked at Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream in Genesis 41 and saw that he gave Pharaoh a word of knowledge by telling him that the two dreams were one and that they were conveying the same theme. So that was a word of knowledge. We saw that Joseph also gave a word of wisdom and that he interpreted the dream and had an answer and a course of direction for the future. So he had a now understanding and he had a future understanding. Let me go back. Uh, the word of knowledge is for now. The word of wisdom is for the future. We looked at Revelation 1 and we saw that John worked in all the revelation gifts as God took him in a vision to heaven. He saw into the spirit realm, discerning of spirits. It was made known to him the deeds, good and bad, of the churches in Asia Minor. That was a word of knowledge. God said, this is what's going on in those churches right now. And then the future was revealed to him, the word of wisdom. 
He not only gives John the understanding of the present problems that are happening in the church in the seven location, but he gives John instructions of what each congregation is to do if they are to survive or be preserved and remain in faith through the future persecution of the Romans. Do you see all of those things working and overlapping in Revelation 1? How is seeing in the spirit realm certain spirits? Because discerning of spirits is anything you see into the spirit realm, whether it be angelics, demonics, whether it's a vision of a, a whole, a whole um, picture, a whole movie going on in, in, in your eyes or head. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's ever been explained like that. Yeah, Maybe the spirit realm opening up to you. And knowing whether they're godly or satanic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, discerning, being able to discern whether what you're seeing is God uh, or some, some uh, you know, demonic entity is messing with you. I, uh, one time, very short story. Okay. When we were over at your mom's, that lady that oh. did all sorts of witchcraft stuff really was there and we yeah. were talking to her. Yeah. I started seeing these twinkles of light over her head. And she saw me looking over her head and she says, oh, you see them? And I said, see what? She says, oh, those are my angels. And I thought, no, they're not your angels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're twinkles of light, but they're not, a, they're not your angels. You saw them and you, and you were able to discern good or, good and ev good or evil. Balaam's donkey worked in discerning the spirits. Yeah, he saw an angel, right? <laughs> he saw it. Yeah. He saw it. I ain't going there. That's right. <laughs> New. So we looked in Acts 9 and saw an incredible believer, Ananias, who in a vision heard the Lord, so he heard and saw, right? Heard the Lord and saw Saul. He received detailed information about Saul, the murderer of Christians, who was waiting for him to come and heal him. Ananias received a word of knowledge about Saul, his location, and the dilemma he was in. He even got the name of the street. It was so detailed, straight. Ananias also received a word of wisdom for the future because God revealed part of Paul's purpose to Ananias and instructed Ananias of what to do when he got to Saul. He told Ananias, tell Paul he will suffer, there will be, he will have much suffering for, for Jesus' sake. He would suffer much. So he told part of Paul's future to Ananias. I, I can't imagine an Ananias in, encompassing yeah. that much. Yeah, revelation in yeah. such a short right. span of time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. And to, to him, the guy that's been killing everybody and burning them at the stake. Exactly. It's like, you know, he was courageous. Yeah. He, was a, he was a courageous man. Well, he, he had and a choice. And obedient. He had a choice. Yes, he had a choice. He, had a, he wasn't initially, I believe. I believe he was a man like anybody else, and he had an opportunity to not. flip or fly. Yes, he had an opportunity to and to obey he, or disobey. And I sat there with. He uh, argued a little bit with God just to make sure God knew what he was doing. Yeah, wouldn't you be? Yeah, and and Ananias is an interesting character. Um, you know, he wasn't an apostle, right? But here he was being used being used to, by God. Yeah, in the New Testament, by the way. God telling us that he's going to send Manson to us and we're going to deliver him and, and he, he has a calling on his life for God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah right. that would be like the same thing. Yeah. He's being told yeah. you're going to suffer much for Christ and yet he goes and does it. Yes. He takes that and praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God that he did. Yeah. Man. And his head was filled with all of the thoughts of what he had done. <sighs> How many Christians... How many disciples had he destroyed? I know. Mm -hmm. He and, murdered. And, yeah. and, and he was so enthusiastic about it. He, it was he a true was conversion. He was on fire. Exactly. Well, God showed up in fire, didn't he? A bright, bright light that just completely blinded him. That and only, he was changed. Only he he could see. He was already going to follow God to death. <laughs> and then all he had to do was switch over to Jesus. <laughs> true, true, God. <laughs> true, yeah, that's funny. So remember that Ananias was not one of the 12 apostles. He may have been one of the 70, according to history, who went out and one of the 120, he obviously was one of the 120 that were in the upper room, according to history. He was devout and obviously full of the Spirit. 
And that's what it takes. Dev devotion and being full of the Spirit. And being obedient, open to hear from God and obey. Was Ananias a Gentile? He was from Damascus, so yes, we think he was a Bedouin. Um, there's no way that it was the same Ananias who was married to Sapphira, right? No, um, not the same. Exactly he died. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, he died. Yeah, yeah, he died. Yeah, no. Was this? Uh, was that after or before? After. That was after that. Mm -hmm. was way after. That was way after. Okay. I would not want to think it was the same. No, it be. Right, right. Oh, okay. Ananias also healed Saul. So gifts of healing. He healed him of his blindness. And he launched the ministry of the most influential apostle to the Gentiles. I mean, this is from a man who wasn't one of the 12. Right. Okay, so let's just get all of that, you know, apostle worship out of our heads. They're called, and we're called to do a mission too. Okay? I'm not putting down the apostles, so praise God for them. And I reverence them. I, I'm very grateful for the cost that they, their lives. I'm very grateful. But God didn't, Jesus didn't die for 12 people. No. But aren't we all apostles as well? Well, we're all sent to do something, right? Yes. We are. That's right. We all have a mission and we all have a calling. The word of wisdom looks to the future and is the revelation of the divine purpose of God concerning people, things, future events, governmental or national purposes. Okay? So we can, God can reveal whatever he wants to reveal about whatever situation or person he wants to reveal to us. And it's for his purposes. It's not for us to be busybodies. It's for us to pray and to be obedient. The word of knowledge reveals facts in present or past tense that God wants us to know. But by the word of wisdom, we can know about future facts, things which are to come, things that reveal the plan, purpose, and the mind of God about the future. Through the word of wisdom, we get a glimpse into the mind of God, what his plans are, because he wants us to partner with his plan, align with his plan, Pro proclaim his plan, perform his plan. That's what it's for. It's not to get puffed up. It's to do something with. Is that what the 49 and 50 days are all about? Thank you. Get rid of all of that. Get rid of all the puff up, the fame. Get rid of all of that and get to the purpose. Get to the purpose of why he's showing you what he's showing you. It's really important that we understand what we see and hear in the spirit realm. If you get something, if you hear something, you don't understand it, go to the Word and ask Him, what are you showing me? What is this you're trying to tell me? Because it could be a warning. It could be something important you need to pray over. In the Old Testament, the prophet functioned in this manifestation of the Spirit along with prophecy. So the prophet in the Old Testament we see over and over, he spoke of the future, right? He did it by prophecy, or sometimes he did it by other means. But a prophet needs to have the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and prophecy. They have to have that in their toolbox at least, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But some of them had more because Elijah rose the, from the dead, and other prophets healed the sick, right? Yeah. So that's a lot of tools in the prophet's belt, so hopefully. Uh, the word of wisdom looks to the future and is the revelation of the divine purpose. Did I get to that? Okay, the simple gift of prophecy has no prediction of the future. Remember, prophecy in itself is just edification, exhortation, and comfort. But if you mix it with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, you get what I did with Keith today. I prophesied over him, but from a mindset of understanding word of knowledge because I saw into your past and a word of wisdom because God was showing me what he wants for your future. Okay, so prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. That was a good example, Lord. Um, so the simple gift of prophecy has no prediction of the future. That takes the word of wisdom. And the word of wisdom, if you know something about the future, you can just say it or you may prophesy it. The prophet works in revelation gifts as well as prophecy. So the prophet has to. Utilizing prophecy, they speak forth a word of wisdom revealing the future or a word of knowledge revealing the present or the past. We also see some um, work in healing and miracles. Gifts overlapping 
For as the Spirit wills to accomplish the will of the Father, the, the gifts, whatever gifts you need for that particular moment should be there for you. Okay? They should be there for you. Word of wisdom doesn't have to be delivered by prophecy. It can just be spoken. It can come by prophecy, but it doesn't have to. Amen. Okay? God may show you something about what's going to happen to you in the next five minutes. You don't need to say, thus saith the Lord. Right. No, you just say, okay, thank you, Lord, for revealing that, and you begin to pray or do something different, whatever, whatever, if it's a, especially if it's a word of warning. You that's, turn the ship around. That's <laughs> recognizing that religion. Exactly. Away from religion. Exactly. God it doesn't have speak. to be religious. Yeah, God can speak. He's not in a box. He's right. not structured to, this is the manual. This is the only way. That's not exactly. Exactly. Listen to the dog. The wind. The wind cannot be constrained. Amen. Amen. The Messianic prophecies were all words of wisdom given by prophecy because they spoke of the future Messiah. Other prophets delivered words of knowledge and words of wisdom by prophecy, like Jeremiah spoke of Israel's sin and idolatry, prophesying and preaching repentance. So the words of knowledge. Hosea acted out Israel's sin and consequences of it. Remember Hosea when he puts on the dirty underwear? Yeah, and then he lays on his side, and then he does all these weird stuff. But it was all for the purposes of revealing the word of knowledge or word of wisdom to the country. John the Baptist did both. He wore the camel's hair. It was a rough way of life. He was giving up everything. He was showing them what God was saying. Give up that and come out, come out from the religious into the wilderness. He lived out what God was saying. Come out of the religion and get into the wilderness with me and be mikvahed and cleaned up and repent for your sin. John did it. He lived it. That's the kind of prophets we are seeing today, that their lives are the prophecy. Their lives are a living prophecy. Because the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of John the Baptist are one and the same. And the spirit of Elijah is being poured out in the end times. So we're going to see people living a prophetic life. We need to. We need. We need to see that. <coughs> words of knowledge, words of wisdom can be received and delivered in different ways. Dreams, words, tongues and interpretation, prophecy, audible voice, vision, inward knowing, prophetic drawing or writing. Okay, so you all got here. You all got here, right? Tonight. Okay. Who took a car? Who took a bus? Who walked? Who flew? But you all got here. You had different transportation, but you all got here. Different transportation, but they're all words of knowledge or words of wisdom. Different vehicles for God to move through. Don't limit him to one way. That becomes religious. He can do whatever he wants. And I think he's about ready to blow our socks off by everything he's going to do. Amen. Amen. Well, we saw it with you one night. One night, we didn't do an hour of deliverance. God just set you free. In less than an hour. In less than an hour, you were set free. I know. And that happened with Brenda? Brianna? Brianna? She had a great time, evidently. She gave a little testimony on Sunday. Yeah. She looked like a different person yeah. Sunday. I mean, she looked like a different person. None of that shame or darkness, none of that was on her. She got up and spoke in front of everybody. That's what she did, was praising God for what God is doing. Amen. Okay, so let's go. We're going to look at Acts. If you want to look in your Bible, you can, or you can read up here with me. Acts 21, 7 through 16. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at this place, Ptolemaeus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now that in itself is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but you know, these, these, kind of man, these kind of giftings go down family lines. Mm -hmm. one of the seven 
He was what? What? One of the seven. One of the seven. I'm not quite sure. Seven, I don't, I'm not quite sure about that. I didn't study that out, but that you is a good question. That house? I know, that'd be pretty Four awesome, wouldn't it? Four unmarried daughters, for one thing, is enough. <laughs> and then they all <laughs> prophesied. Are you yeah. Me? While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people were ur urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Now, I wouldn't recommend not obeying the word of the Lord, but Paul didn't. The word, though, wasn't for him not to go. It was just what was going to happen. What was going to happen. So that was a word of wisdom. What the, my point in sharing this was that was a word of wisdom given by demonstration and, pro and prophecy. It, That's a pretty, pretty interesting way of delivery. Yeah, and I think in this case it was probably to give him more fortitude that when it happened that he would know it wasn't just incidental and it wasn't necessarily Satan directly. That I don't know. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say whether it was... It didn't all we know him. is that it didn't discourage him, yeah. but all we know is he didn't obey. He didn't yeah. stay there. You could he, go either way on that one. Right? right, you could go either way on that. After these, days, um, after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of, of Manson of... I don't know, Nassan of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. So Agabus reveals something in Paul's future, which is a word of wisdom and with demonstration. Paul didn't heed it, but the word still came to pass. Okay, even though he didn't heed the word, the word still came to pass. So we know it was a good word because it, it did come to pass. Some words of wisdom, because they deal with the future, can be correct, wrong, or conditional. Agabus's word was correct. Now, if Paul hadn't been bound, it would have been incorrect, right? Or the word could be like, if you, well, this was kind of true. If you go into Jerusalem, you're going to get bound up, right? So, so that was conditional because he did go in and he got bound up. Had he not, he would not have gotten bound up. So words of wisdom, because they deal with the future, can be correct, wrong, or conditional. What's interesting is about a conditional word is prayer changes things. Mm -hmm. You can get a warning, and you can throw yourself on the mercy of the court, and sometimes you can get off. God will change his mind, and we'll see that in Scripture. Words of knowledge are present and past and can therefore not be changed. A word of knowledge is either right or wrong. <laughs> Grayson, you know, he's practicing, and he comes home, and he says, man, I, got, I, I thought I got this word for somebody, and, you know, and so I, you know, he, does, he has a way of asking questions and, and getting the person to talk about, about it so he can verify whether his word was correct. He was completely off. Do you, do you want me to tell it? Yeah, tell it. Okay, so we were, we were on the plane from Phoenix to Florida, and I was next to a dad, a mom, and then his three daughters. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, Lord, what, what do you have for him? Anything, you know, get stuff like um, he's an, an electrical engineer and specifically works on F-35s. And I'm like, okay, so we're in Phoenix. Well, let me do some research first. I paid $12 for internet, by the way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> just to look this up. <laughs> so I paid $12 for internet because we were on the plane. Okay. And I'm like, all right, F-35s, which is a very nice, the nicest military jet that's out there right now, um, our F-35s based in Phoenix. And right, you know, right next to this airport, there's um, Luke. Uh, Air Force Base right. that has an F-35 there. I'm like, okay, so there's probably like pretty accurate. And it's Luke Air Force. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's get really spiritual. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, 
I'm like, okay, God, this is this is good. So I, I look over at him, and he's just he's next to me, and he's got like a military style watch. He's got a buzz cut, and I'm like, okay, this is going good. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> you know? it looks good. Uh, and, ooh. Uh, okay. Sit so I, I talk to him, and they're going on vacation. Um, they're going down to the Bahamas on a cruise, and I'm like, so he makes pretty good money. He can support that. <laughs> so every check, 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 check. 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 So. I end up talking to him longer. I, I wind up finding out that he's not an electrical engineer that works on F-35s, but a chemistry teacher at a high school. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was it. I was like, well, all right, no. Not it. it. But, Did you um, tell? You, you, you no, he never told him. No. Oh. No. No, he was just, he was <laughs> testing the gift, you know. He's yeah, trying to he's learn, like, but he has had so really accurate... Serious. He's had really accurate words too. Give us a short, accurate word that you've gotten. Me. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Me. I'm sitting right here. Yeah. He was dead spot on. Spot on about your life and stuff. Yeah. Man. See, so you gotta you gotta test it out. You I gotta had, get had practice. Ones outside of church. I've had one and it was a word of knowledge about a, a lady's lower back. Mm. That was it. Yeah. But Just everything else, other prophecies, nope. Keep you working. You words of knowledge though, in dreams that were accurate. Uh, well, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've, had, I've, had, I've had other people's memories thrown at me, but it wasn't me doing it. I'm just available was more of the thing. Yeah, so but it's still a word of knowledge. Was, yeah, it wasn't like I was seeking it out, though. It was kind of mm -hmm. like God needed to tell that person I'm a vessel. Yeah. So yeah, you, we've got to practice in the gifts. You know, they they don't they you don't always. It takes a while to get accurate and feel comfortable and have faith to know that yes, what God is saying is true. And you know, you and you will. And the more you utilize them, the stronger you're going to get in it. Two things. Okay, I have, Two things. I have a question. Then, when I was um, sitting and, and journaling on Saturday morning, and mm -hmm. I kept seeing that picture and with Lisa in that house. Of what what. Was that a gift or was that just yes. us saying, listen? <laughs> yeah, you were, you were journaling and you got into some prophetic writing and God started revealing things to you. So word of knowledge by prophetic writing. And then, a and then you said you saw it. Oh, yeah. So then, you, then it was Very vision. Clear. Okay. So yeah, yeah, definitely it's a gift. Definitely. Sure, not anything we can do. And most people are not at all in tune to this without the Holy Spirit. They're not. Mm -hmm. Now, if they have a spirit of witchcraft, they can. Okay. So, oh. so Sean Bowles says. <laughs> so Sean Bowles says two things. The word can be off, or he says one thing. The word can be off, but as long as the love is on, you're good. Oh, so yeah. That's like one thing to always pay attention to. It's like don't just go for it for the word and you know, glory to God and all that stuff. But yeah, be moved with compassion stuff. and love when you're doing when you're working in the um, gifts, and if you're wrong, just admit, hey, I missed it. Now, see the other that one night um, with uh, the girl at your house, Audra, and I saw some things about uh, witchcraft in her past, and she was like, "No, no, no," and I, I said, "Okay, well, I'm, I'm really off." Well, then the next week she comes back. She said, "Man, I was talking to my brother, and yeah, there's a whole line of witches in my, my mom's family." Jezebel. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, there you go. She just didn't know about, she didn't it. Know about it. She didn't know about it. But then she went and got the confirmation, and I'm glad she told me because, man, I, I thought that I knew for sure. It's tough. So it's a good I, confirmation. I people too, where you have a word of knowledge, and either they're uncomfortable with it, or they're just uncomfortable with the situation, and they'll say no. Yeah, they don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> later, they'll come around and admit that it was true. Yeah. It takes people a while, you know. It's kind of a weird thing, right? Yeah. So to the world. Then the other thing. Okay, right. that's okay. Um, is you have to be available to be a fool for God. <laughs> Very good. And that's the biggest thing is that I'm learning right now. And he, I remember asking God, you know, that's not accurate. That's not in the Bible. That's, you know, <laughs> what is this? That No, that's not a thing. Being wrong for you is not the right thing. Like, none of it made sense. Well, then he showed me how... Um, Noah went out to the people and prayed and tried to help them and tried to show them, you know, come back in and looked like a fool and everyone laughed at him and mocked him right. for what he was doing. He was, you know, building an ark. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's another? But God knew <laughs> that no one would come. Mm -hmm. But He still wanted him to be obedient to His word. Yeah, that's right. That's it. Well, look at Jose. Look at Jose. I mean, how many times did he go after Gomer? Yeah. Everybody was ridiculing him, like, right. oh, "Are you kidding me?" And then yeah. he finally bought her from the auction block, and right. they were like, "You've yeah. got to be kidding me!" Right. But he did it because he was obeying God. He was obeying God, and that's yeah. the most important he didn't thing. Look like a fool. There's the scripture yeah. that says, "Sometimes we look like fools for God." Yeah. And yeah, fools sometimes speaking. if we're not willing to look like a fool. How you want to look good on the other side mm -hmm. of that? Sometimes you, God will put you in that right. position. Yeah, self-preservation. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's the enemy of God. Fire. That's why we need the sometimes baptism of fire. The way he touches us, he he makes you look stupid, so part of your dignity gets burned into the ground with you. Mm -hmm. That's it right. We don't need dignity. Yeah, that's true. We don't need dignity. Well, it's Very a good lot word. Easier to say than it is it, to live. Right. Well, that's part of it, right? See, that you get yeah. yeah that's, that's why you, why you go you, you take baby steps of other people and saying of them man i wish i had that you just and you have it you do With have it tin man it's like you just don't like, know yeah you yeah. got it you just you know you yeah. just, just have there. the thing is is it's mixed with a lot of self-preservation pride comes before the fall. Well, yeah. better to right what's Except that it's a lot better to bend your knee than to have it broken. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's go on. So, okay, let's look at the word of wisdom given to Isaiah for King Hezekiah that did not come to pass. Isaiah gave a word that did not come to pass. It was changed because of the king's prayer. It was conditional. Under the present conditions, this is what is going to happen. If my people, but, but, so what God is saying when he gives gives a word he's saying under the present conditions this is what's going to happen to you now it's up to you whether you turn right right and it's up to him whether he has mercy because he will have mercy on who he will have mercy on right but he does promise us if my people will humble themselves and pray i will heal their land mm -hmm. and if we didn't believe in prayer there would be no hope so let's read Second uh, Kings 20, 1 through 6. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, for you are about to die. You will not recover. That was the word he got. Oh. Yeah. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. And prayed to the Lord, please, O Lord, remember I ha how I have worked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion. I have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And he had. He had done what good in the sight of the Lord until he did it. And then the Lord sent Isaiah to give him the word and says, you're out of here. So he turned his face to the wall and prayed. Before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard... The word of the Lord came to him saying, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. This is what the Lord, the God of your father, David said. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will surely heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of all my, serv of my servant David. No, he didn't do it for the sake of Hezekiah. He did it for the covenant. He's a covenant God. He's a covenant God. But here's a word that says you're dead. The guy repented. Does it make, does it make Isaiah a false prophet? No. The prophet was obviously a conditional thing. And I wonder how many prophecies are. You know, the, Isaiah having to go back and say, oops. Yeah, and he didn't make a mistake. He says, it's like God changed his mind because of the prayers and the weeping, the true repentance. That should tell us a lot. With people, when people are truly repentant, it does move God's heart. It sounds a little bit confusing to, to hear that because I, I picture trying to discern and listen to Isaiah or discern and listen to prophets of Baal, you know, or recognizing... Oops, I made a mistake. Yeah. You know, it was like, 
Mm, you gotta have, you, you gotta see their fruit. Yeah. So you have to have discernment yourself. Right. You not have to believe yes. and trust the wrong one. Right. And I, what I tell people when they get a word from somebody, you take that word and you go to other people that you can trust and you know and that know you. And you say, this is the word that I gave. Will you pray about this with me? Because I'm just not quite sure about this. Now that is worth it's, repeating. Well, yeah, because it's it's wisdom. Yeah, it really <laughs> not the word of wisdom, but it's wisdom. <laughs> okay, because you, you, there's lots of people going around prophesying things, woo -woo. right? Well, and they can be woo-woo. But then you can have somebody that really does prophesy the word of the Lord and misses it sometimes because we're human. Right. Right, so... It's always good to take those words, pray over them, ask the Lord, ask your prayer partner or your confidant person, and, and go from there. And sometimes you just put it on the shelf. Now, obviously, Hezekiah couldn't put this one on the shelf. He had to get down to business right then. Yeah, put it on the wall. The Lord spoke a conditional prophecy to King Solomon in 2 Kings 9 and 2 Chronicles 7, 8 to 11. When Solomon had finished the house of the Lord and the royal palace, successfully carrying out all that was in his heart to do for the house of the Lord and for his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I close the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a plague coming among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So he's making a covenant with him, and he's saying, if he has to discipline them by devourers and, no, and famine and drought, if they will humble themselves and pray, he will hear from heaven and he will heal their land. That's a conditional prophecy. Okay. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. For I have now chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there, there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, doing all I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as I coveted it with your father David when I said, you will never fail to have a man to rule over Israel. That's a lot of ifs. A lot of ifs. Yeah. And you've got to think about, he had built the temple. Now you've got to go back and read how much it took to build that temple. And when they were done, the glory of the Lord came in the temple. The priests couldn't stand. It was so thick. That's what's supposed to happen with us. We are that temple. And if we will follow his statutes and ordinances, all will go well with us. If we turn from them, and he disciplines us, if we will bow our knee in repentance, he will come and heal us. It is a promise to us. We are the temple of God. The covenant of David is still working in our lives because it came unto Jesus. And we're in Jesus. Jonah received a prophecy with the word of wisdom about Nineveh, right? That God was going to wipe them out. And he had to go and preach repentance, right? Because of the repentance of the people of Nineveh, that prophecy of destruction was postponed to a later generation. Was postponed to a later generation. But they lived. Yeah, they people. lived. Those people lived. And the other people would have lived had they stayed in the Lord's favor. God is not looking to wipe people out. <laughs> he does. <laughs> but he does. He because, of, because of their rebellion and their bloodthirstiness and their and it all of the sin that you know besets us acts 8 we see philip who earlier was appointed to serve tables and be a deacon philip was a deacon serving tables that's pretty awesome and he made philip into an evangelist during the great persecution and scattering of the laity 
They scattered everywhere and preached Christ, healing the sick, casting out devils, etc. Philip was part of the laity. Laity means he wasn't one of the apostles. He was a server of tables. And God turned him into an evangelist. He ends up in Gaza talking to an Ethiopian who was headed home after worshiping in Jerusalem. This was very interesting because it had to be during the feast of some sort because they all had to make the pilgrim, pilgrimage to, uh, to Jerusalem for unleavened bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. So it had to be one of those feasts or the first two. Right? Acts 8, 1 through 25. And Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. Remember, talk, remember Stephen was stoned to death. And Paul, Saul, was there giving approval to Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but all the laity scattered out were sent. Don't you think they were sent? Don't you think that Stephen's death God used to spread his word in Judea and Samaria? God, no, God has this plan that we don't quite understand, but he's going to give us words of wisdom so that we can align with his plan. God-fearing men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. God took the blood of Stephen and turned it against the devil. Do you know that's what he's going to do now? Don't think that the blood of millions and millions of babies will go unattended to. In a similar way, um, he... God used uh, the events of World War II to put the people back in the land. Oh. And it's a very, very hard thing to even say, but that is God, exactly what I'm repeating it for the camera. God used the events of World War II to put his people back in the land. To establish a national, to establish a national Israel. God takes what the devil means for bad and he turns it into his plan. He uses it. Okay, so God-fearing men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them. The crowds gave their undivided attention to Philip's message and the signs they saw him perform, and, and, the, and the signs they saw him perform. With loud shrieks, unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, and many of the paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So this deacon had gifts of healings and miracles. He was turned into an evangelist. So I'm thinking that healing and miracles are part of an evangelist toolbox. Right? Yeah, sure looks like it. Sure looks like it. Yeah. Uh, prior to that time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and astounded the people of Samaria. He claimed to be someone great, and all the people from the least to the greatest heeded his words and said, This man is divine power, called, by a, uh, called a, the great power. Can you imagine somebody being called the great power? Sounds like a Oz. carnival yeah. sideshow, right? Like right. Um, yes, yeah, like Oz. They paid close attention to him because he had astounded them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized. He followed Philip closely and was astounded by the great signs and miracles he observed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. On their arrival, they prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. One baptized, right? Yeah. Baptized into the name. But they had not been baptized or mikvahed into the Holy Spirit yet. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So we see the baptism mixed into the name. We see a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see a special impartation by the laying on of hands. 
We're seeing a lot of things going on in the spirit here. When Simon saw that the spirit was given to, given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Give me this power as well, he said, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's nothing too bad with that. There's nothing so bad with that. You would want to have that gift too, right? But he was rebuked. Peter replied, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in our ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for the intent of your heart. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. So he has a word of knowledge, right? He discerns the guy's heart, his intentions and motives, and he has a word of knowledge that he's captive to, by bitterness and some kind of iniquity. There's a lot of stuff going on here, right? And I think there's more in our lives. We just don't know it. We have not recognized that it's working like that. It just seems natural, right? But we're working in some of this already. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me. He doesn't want to pray. He says to Simon, you pray. You pray for me. No, he should have got on his face like King Hezekiah did, like Solomon did, go to the wall. But no, he didn't. He says, you, he says, he, he says, you pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. It's already there. It's already there. <laughs> That's kind of weak. So right. But yeah. he, you could tell he, wouldn't, he wasn't ready to repent. Yeah, he, there was no relationship. There was no relationship. Yes, very good. And there's no comment after that as to the thing. No, nope. and that was it. <laughs> and, after, and after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go south to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Discerning of spirits and a personal word of instruction, guidance, right? So he, is to, so he started out by faith. Man, I mean, you don't, he had to have faith to actually go, right? Even though an angel says something doesn't mean you don't have to have faith. You can disobey an angel, right? And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official in charge of the entire treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his return was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. So he went to, he was going to Jerusalem to worship. So he's already a devout man that believed in Yahweh, right? He was reading Isaiah. And so we have the delivery of instruction by an angel. And somehow he was at one or two. He could have been at unleavened bread and stayed for Shavuot. Or he was coming back from Jerusalem from, from Sukkot. Because those three, you had to go if you were a believer. The Spirit said to Philip, go over to that chariot and stay by it. So there you go. Word of knowledge. It's for now. It's right now. So Philip ran up and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can recount his descendants? For his life was, re was removed from the earth. Tell me, said the eunuch, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with the very scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road and came to some water, the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can prevent me from being baptized? He was already a believer. Right? He's going to get water baptized. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So we have mikvah into the name and unto the body of Christ. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went his way rejoicing. So we have physical translation of this deacon made evangelist. Pretty good confirmation for the eunuch. Right? Yeah, but Philip appeared at Azotus and traveled through that region, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So here we have him starting here 
and going down to Gaza. And then he meets the eunuch somewhere in this area. And then he's translated here. And then he preaches all the way up the coast. So he, translate his, he translated approximately 12.5 miles, according to this map. Now that's the way to travel. Yeah, that's the way to travel, right? So this is where somebody says, well, do you think he still had wet clothes on when he got... <laughs> yeah, right? Funny. <laughs> He may have. Yeah, right. yeah. The moral of the story, if we apply faith to any personal word or of instruction by an angel, the leading of the spirit, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, or any other communication from God, no telling where we will end up. But we can expect miraculous encounters with man and God. God wants this to happen. God is ready to show himself to, this, to the people of the earth in this day. I, I'll, I'm going to give you a couple of testimonies, and then I want to hear some testimonies from you. So one of my experiences happened when I was in terrible sin and had resisted the calling of the Spirit uh, to come back into, you know, like the prodigal, to come back home. And I had resisted over uh, years. And um, finally, a dog attacked me and broke two bones, tore a ligament, punctured me several times, and after several minutes, the dog miraculously released me. I immediately heard the voice of the Father. Next time, I will kill you. The knowing I had in my spirit was that he would allow me to die so that my soul would be saved. The veil of deception, all the deception that I was in, um, was removed. Um, And I realized at that moment that God was dis disciplined me so that I would come home. And he warned me that if I didn't come home, that the next time I would die. This began true repentance and the life of restoration that I have today. A word of wisdom given to me by an audible voice of warning of the future I would have if I continued in the direction I was going. So it was conditionally. It was a conditional word. And you can see in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32, that if we don't judge ourselves, we will be judged. And we will experience the discipline of the Father. So if you don't think my story is scriptural, I suggest you read 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32. And it changed my life. A word of wisdom, word of knowledge, can change someone's life. We need to understand that. That's why we should not withhold these things when we get them for people. It can change their lives, right? Right? For over 10 years, I received through prophecies of prophets and other people that I would um, have children. And this went on from the beginning of our marriage through two miscarriages, and I just didn't want to hear any more prophecies that I would have children. Um, the prophecy came to pass after 14 years, but during that time, I lost hope. I was, we were ready to adopt, and uh, we were discussing agencies, when I found out I was pregnant with Andrea. So the words that I got were true words and they came to pass despite my own faith because I had lost hope, okay? God's word will come to pass. His divine plans and purposes will come to pass. And he, he gave them through many different people to establish his word in my life. Yeah, we were going to get an Eskimo. <laughs> yes, where you, where, 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 an Eskimo. Ishmael. An Ishmael. Where, where was your faith? Now she, you were, he just you wanted were, to make were, me happy. You were done. Yeah. You he, were done. I was just, done. She wanted, she wanted to talk. He just wanted me to be happy. Okay. Yeah. You guys remember we were there in Tahoe. Tahoe when I found out. And we had I'd written two agencies. They sent us pamphlets. It's about seven thousand dollars to adopt an infant, and we were going to make a decision when we came back from that week in Tahoe as With to you guys. To pick. And on Wednesday, when I went skiing, she started throwing up. Yeah. God, just in the nick of time. Yeah. Before we did something we weren't supposed to do. 
I it, tell you what, God is always, good. That's confirmation almost always for me that in the nick of time. In the nick of time. It's not way in advance and there's no problems. Yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. no, it's right down to the wire. And yeah. I think, I think what, what I want you to take away from this story is that the people who prophesied over me, it was the word itself that bore the seed that came to pass. It wasn't my faith. Okay. When, pe when the prophet speaks a word, sometimes you have to agree. Sometimes you fight against it, but it will still come to pass. If it's a true word from God. Yeah. I think the bigger miracle word to me was in understanding we lost our second baby. It uh, been in Allison for two months. We saw its heart beat and it died. That's what lifted us up. And Allison was so mad at God. And what amazes me the most, it was about, let's see, we were in Tahoe, we always went the week of Valentine's, February 14th. Mm -hmm. Somewhere mid-January, yeah. you had finally cried out to God and said, fine, I can live without a baby if that's what you want the rest of my life, but I can't live without you. You were done being mad at God. Yeah, I'd given up my anger when toward we God. Went, when we went and... You know, they can measure babies pretty accurately and know when, about when they're conceived, you know. New Year's Eve. And we <laughs> knew from a couple week period and what was going in her work and mine, we knew Andrea had been conceived on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. Before Allison had even made this with God, she was already pregnant. Yeah. But I know God knew she was going to and gave, it, gave Andrea to us then. Mm -hmm. God is good. And the last, the last one I wanted to talk about is uh, at a full gospel businessmen's meeting, you called me up to pray for a young girl. And uh, the Lord gave me uh, a word of knowledge that the girl was getting caught up in a lesbian lifestyle. And I prayed for her. And um, I saw her father about a year later, and she was completely delivered and restored. Um, and that word changed her life. The fact that God knew her pain. So just knowing someone, knowing about someone's life is so important. Um, it's God, God gives you this precious, precious thing. Um, and you've got to treat it with respect. Mm 